I am Jacob Lang. Um, I'm an optometrist at Associated Eye Care on the east side of the Twin Cities metro region in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, and western Wisconsin. Uh, there I am the lead optometrist, residency coordinator, um, dry eye medical director, um, affiliated with um, Illinois College of Optometry for our residency program, as well as Ohio State and Salus. I uh, graduated from New England College of Optometry, where I also did my residency quite a while ago, uh, but we don't need to get into those details. Today, I'll be uh, speaking with you about thyroid eye disease, um, TED Talks here. So uh, an update on thyroid eye disease. Um, so just to get started, we'll, we'll try and make this a little more interactive as, a, um, you know, as we're spread across the nation. Um, and possibly internationally. Um, if you want to go to pollev.com, Jacob Lang 676, or text, um, you can participate this, with these polls and um, we can go over them during the question and answer portion, use that as kind of some of our topics for discussion after the lecture. So just as an introduction to get a feel of how common this is and, and what people are seeing in clinic, have you ever, have you seen a patient with thyroid eye disease in the last six months? All right, we'll talk again about these again in the question and answer portion, but let me know your thoughts. And here's my financial disclosures, um, companies I've worked with. And then let's get into this. Let's, uh, let's delve right in, start talking about thyroid eye disease. When we think about thyroid eye disease, everyone probably thinks about Graves' disease. And one of the big, one of the big things I want to touch on today is, is their differences. Um, that, that they're not the same thing. Graves' disease is actually the thyroid dysfunction. So um, it's the most common form of hyperthyroidism that endocrinologists see. Um, affects approximately 25 per 100,000 people. Um, and it's actually a dysregulation of the thyroid hormones because of autoantibodies. Um, these autoantibodies, this autoimmune condition, um, is targeting the thyroid stimulating hormone receptors, TSHR, and triggering the production of thyroid hormones. So these antibodies attack or attach um, to that thyroid and cause it to overact, typically. Um, it's also known as toxic diffuse goiter um, and is, is, is often results in a, a large thyroid or goiter. And we can see that in the picture um, to the side. Um, signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism, the most common uh, thyroid dysfunction seen with Graves' disease, irritability, muscle weakness, sleeping problems, a fast heartbeat, tachycardia, poor tolerance of heat, diarrhea, unintentional weight loss. So they're kind of just going all the time, right? The thyroid is firing and so are they. Other symptoms uh, include the thickening of the skin on the tibia um, or in the shins known as pretibial myxedema. Um, Acropachy is a dermatopathy associated with Graves' disease in the, in the fingers. So we'll actually see this kind of clubbing of the tips of the fingers that's also in uh, the picture to the right here. So some other things that are associated with Graves' disease besides thyroid hormones. The most common thing we think of, or if you Google Graves' disease, the most common thing you're going to see is eye dysfunction, the most um, prevalent and um, prominent, unfortunately, manifestation besides thyroid hormone dysfunction is this orbitopathy that we get. And that is really um, where things are going. Autoantibodies against that um, thyroid stimulating hormone receptor again, causing that increased level of thyroid hormones. So when endocrinologists see patients with thyroid, I, or, um, sorry, Graves' disease, so when endocrinologists see people with Graves' disease, they're really worried about their hormone levels, right? So they're too high, we need them to be lower. And currently our therapies include surgery to remove some or all of the thyroid so that it can't produce so much hormone, um, medications to try and downregulate it or calm it down. Um, but probably the most common thing you'll see and, and, that, and that is done is radioactive iodine. So they, uh, they use radioactive iodine to target and actually kill the thyroid. So the thyroid's overacting, we knock it out. So we just eliminate the thyroid production, and as it's removed or uh, shut down, now we need medications to supplement um, the thyroid production because we can't live without our thyroid hormones. So now you're on Synthroid for the rest of your days because your thyroid's not working anymore. 
Now, eye doctor's role here. So thyroid eye disease, uh, Ted, thyroid eye disease, really a separate thing. And that's one, one of the big things I want to bring home today. I want you to leave taking home that pearl that thyroid eye disease is a separate condition associated with Graves' disease, but separate condition that, that really we should be looking for, acknowledging, treating, and, and managing with our patients. So thyroid eye disease, 16 out of 100,000 women, five times less likely in men. So rather uncommon in men, but when men get thyroid eye disease, they have typically more severe disease. So if a man gets thyroid eye disease, he gets it in spades, right? He gets it all the way. It's more severe um, disease, more progressive disease. There tends to be two peaks of incidence that occur in patients between 40 and 49 and 60 to 70 years of age. So um, in that early presbyopic years and then those later presbyopic years, if there's, if there's something good about the 50s, it's that your presbyopia is kind of plateauing and that you're less likely to get thyroid eye disease. Smoking is a huge thing in thyroid eye disease, huge risk factor. Um, so smoking increases the risk of thyroid eye disease eightfold. So eight times more risk of getting thyroid eye disease um, in patients when they smoke. So if there's one thing you can take home to your patients, if you're seeing someone with Graves disease, if you're seeing someone with thyroid dysfunction, they just can't smoke. They just, it's just not an option. It's gotta be a huge priority. You know, smoking's not good for macular degeneration, diabetes, you know, all these things. But here in the setting of, uh, you know, autoimmune thyroid disease, it is a no-no. Um, so if you can please talk to your patients about that, educate them about the increased risks, especially those younger women with thyroid dysfunction. Um, and there's a 20% risk of new or worsening thyroid eye disease after radioactive iodine therapy. So patients going in to have their thyroid treated, uh, shut down with radioactive iodine, actually have a 20% increase in new or worsening thyroid eye disease around that post-operative period. So if you're seeing a patient that's going to have that done or um, has it planned to have that done or has it done recently, you might want to follow up with them to watch their eyes a little more closely in that perioperative period because of that increased risk uh, post-operatively, post-procedurally. So again, age-adjusted U.S. incidence, 16 um, cases per 100,000 in women and three cases per 100,000 in men and those peaks of incidence in the 40s and the 60s. Again, thyroid eye disease is the most common orbital disease in North America and frequently associated with Graves' disease. Association, not the same, but most common orbital disease. So if you see somebody with some sort of orbital problem, chances are it's thyroid eye disease. Um, it's not technology, entertainment, and design. So those um, podcasters out there that are um, listening to TED Talks, that's what it stands for, technology, entertainment, and design, not thyroid eye disease. Although thyroid eye disease often occurs in patients with hyperthyroidism, it's not distinct. Um, in treating the thi uh, thyroid dysfunction does not help the ocular symptoms, the ocular signs, the ocular issues. So you could have a patient that's doing great, taking Synthroid, and um, their thyroid levels are perfect, and they have thyroid eye disease. If you're seeing thyroid eye disease, it doesn't mean the patient, you know, needs to see their endocrinologist to adjust their synthroid levels either. You know, this are two separate things. So um, it may mean, and then you probably want to check their thyroid levels, but it doesn't necessarily show an association with thyroid eye disease and thyroid level dysfunction. At the root of thyroid eye disease is this pathophysiology of the activation of fibroblasts. So scar makers, right? Fibrin makers. Um, these fibroblasts in and around the orbit are uh, activated by antibodies. Again, this autoimmune activation of antibodies in the orbit, which leads to inflammation. How many times do we say that in eye disease? Inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. So we know inflammation is such a problem in so many pathologies in the ocular system. And this is one more of them. So orbital inflammation is at the root of problem with thyroid eye disease. There's active inflammation by stimulating these antibodies on the orbital fibroblasts. Um, again, activation of those um, antibodies causing the inflammation we see in the orbit, the proptosis, the lid retraction, all those things that we're going to get to here. 
So subsequent ocular pathology. So we get this orbital inflammation and what downstream effects do we get? Well, we get dry eye, exposure, proptosis, lid retraction, all those things are affected. Our blink dynamics and the increased frictional forces of our eyelids trying to cover up um, and uh, pump tears across this protruding uh, globe. But also inflammation, right? We're gonna see inflamed eyes, inflamed eye muscles, um, inflamed ocular surface. And then some of the more severe things we worry about, uh, the big one is optic nerve compression, right? We get too much inflammation in that small uh, apex of the orbit, and there's too much swelling and not enough space, which leads to compression of the optic nerve, which can be sight-threatening and, and uh, a cause of complete vision loss for some patients, unfortunately. Diplopia, of course, we're uh, changing the structure of the orbit, the muscles, the orbital fat, these things which can lead to double vision and how debilitating that can be for our patients. So e EOM infiltration, inflammation, and fibrosis. Uh, you can see the image here, how swollen that inferior rectus is. Again, uh, manifestations of thyroid eye disease Conjunctival and cornea, we're getting chemosis, conjunctival redness, epiphora, photophobia, foreign body sensation, pain, exposure. What does that sound like to everyone out there? It sounds like what I see a lot every day um, in my dry eye clinic. So a lot of those common symptoms and signs might be associated with the ocular surface disease uh, related to an autoimmune inflammation um, that's related to thyroid eye disease. Eyelid retraction, probably the most common sign of thyroid eye disease found in 91% of patients. Um, again, that pain, lag ophthalmus, um, increased friction between the globe and the lids. Proptosis, another uh, common one, 62% affected. Um, these patients also have a lot of pain, deep ache, and of course, disfigurement. This cosmetically is not... Um, not a fun thing for our patients to go through. We're going to talk a little bit more about the, the quality of life issues that are, are associated with this, this condition. And diplopia, um, optometry, you know, really at the root of a lot of care for our patients with diplopia for convergence and divergence issues and vision therapy. But uh, again, a pathology that can lead to diplopia and about 51% of patients um, and also pain with those. So our next polling question here, if you suspect, suspected thyroid eye disease or you suspect thyroid eye disease in a patient you're seeing, what would you do next? So what would you do as their eye care provider um, to rule in or rule out thyroid eye disease? Would you punt? Would you send that out to someone else? Would you treat the patient um, for thyroid eye disease? Would you order imaging in labs? Or would you watch and wait? Would you have the patient come back and see how it goes? So if, of those that said I would punt, it's fourth and one for me, um, I'm punting. Where would you send the patient? Would you send them to the primary care physician, a general ophthalmologist, neuro-ophthalmology, oculoplastics, endocrinology? Where would you send those patients? Awesome. Thyroid eye disease risk factors. Again, to summarize uh, things that I wanted to, you guys to take home today, uh, increased risk of developing thyroid eye disease up to eightfold with smoking, um, maybe worse after radioactive iodine or increased risk by 20% after radioactive iodine therapy. Women much more common than men, but if men have thyroid eye disease, it tends to be more severe. Um, the older you are, the more likely these things are to happen two peaks between 40 and 50 and 60 to 70. And then those um, TRAB levels, uh, thyroid reactive antibodies um, may be correlated with the prognosis. So if they have a lot of antibodies, they might have a lot of eye disease. All right, so a case. Let's get into the cases here. These are things you do every day, patients you see every day. Here's a 52-year-old female. So shouldn't be having. She's a little lower risk, right? She's not in that peak, but history of Graves disease traded with iodine a year ago, noted increasing redness and buggy eye over the last three to four months. Denies double vision or pain, but dryness and vision's not right. And the eyes don't close at night. We're just telling you everything that you need to know, right? Of course, taking Synthroid, good 
good vision, good color vision. Um, IOP is uh, elevated in up gaze. So again, we're seeing some restriction that might cause um, increased IOP in those gazes where we're pressing on the globe. SPK across the cornea, injection, especially over the recti muscles, three and nine. Her tells are a little above normal, 24 and 25. And optic nerve and a fundus appear normal. And that's our patient. So we can see under imaging here, some inflammation, swelling under those extraocular muscles consistent with thyroid eye disease. And then this is post-surgical lid correction. So this patient has all those inflammation and fibrosis in her extraocular muscles and eventually had repair um, with decompression and, and uh, lid correction. And that's what she looks like afterwards. Pretty good outcome. Unfortunately, our, all our patients don't look so great. So how would we grade thyroid eye disease? So kind of similar things. This is kind of evolving, but how do we grade thyroid eye disease? We kind of use the standard, you know, just like we grade nuclear sclerosis in our patients, we can grade those patients with thyroid eye disease on kind of that one to four scale, mild, moderate, severe, and really severe or site threatening. Um, we'd define lid retraction as mild if it's less than two millimeters, moderate around two millimeters, and severe more than two millimeters. The soft tissue involvements, mild, moderate, severe. Proptosis, greater than three millimeters compared to normal for their um, race, uh, equal to or greater than three millimeters is moderate and severe um, more than three millimeters. Diplopia, how do we grade diplopia? So kind of absent or transient, uh, inconstant, not all the time, or all the time. And then uh, corneal exposure, uh, absent, mild, moderate. And then, of course, the optic nerve, that last, um, but very, very important part of this. Um, it can be compressed at that site-threatening or ultra-severe stage. Uh, here's another case, a uh, patient with thyroid eye disease, uh, showing the lid retraction, the proptosis, and just that inflammation, right? That redness, that red angry eye that we're seeing that we don't want to mistake as dry eye or, or something else that might be allergic conjunctivitis, for example. Uh, here's the patient's findings, proptosis, um, exophthalmetry is showing a little bit of increased diplopia. There is some diplopia in this patient. Then there's this CAS score, um, anyone heard of CAS score? Well, let's talk about what CAS is. CAS is Clinical Activity Score, and it's another way of us grading the active inflammation and thyroid eye disease as we develop and kind of refine how we look at this disease. So the Clinical Activity Score for thyroid eye disease is kind of like the, the speed score, the OSDI, if you will, the DEQ5 that we use in dry eye. I kind of think of the CAS score as thyroid eye disease clinical activity score. That's kind of a, a similar um, uh, scale for our patients. Um, we've got spontaneous orbital pain, gave evoked orbital pain, swelling, erythema, chemosis. Each one of these gives you a point. Um, so if you had all seven um, at the initial score, you'd have a CAS score of seven. Again, our patient had seven and five. So he did it out of the park there in the left eye. At follow-ups, you also include eight, nine, and 10, increase in proptosin, a worsening of disease, um, decrease of acuity, um, which we worry about optic nerve compression, right? So that is our CAS score there. Again, another case here, we can definitely see um, some clinical activity going on here. Um, so proptosis 24, diplopia no, but CAS score of five in both eyes. So some significant disease here. Um, that we're seeing, again, thinking about how we grade and see and think about how to document a thyroid eye disease. And case three, we can, there's a better example of that lid retraction. Again, very common thing we'll see about 90% of patients, I'm sorry, 60% of patients will have that lid retraction, especially in the patient's right eye here. Um, again, increased proptosis, a little bit of diplopia, and pretty active uh, clinical activity score. Again, here's some proptosis we're seeing in another case here with a left eye. Again, kind of demonstrating how this doesn't have to be a binocular condition, that actually a lot of times this is an asymmetric condition, just like glaucoma will have a kind of a troublemaker eye. 
that one eye is more active with clinical activity um, than the other eye. And so we'll see that asymmetry. So if we see asymmetry in retraction or asymmetry in uh, dry eye, we should just be thinking about what might be causing such an asymmetric presentation, um, and it might be orbital disease. Again, we can see the inflammation being so asymmetric in this case, attacking that uh, medial rectus here, um, and then uh, the orbital flat as well, and in, in, by the yellow arrow here. Um, here's a, a case presentation, 65-year-old female with four months of swelling and redness. So diagnosed with allergies and inflammation, right? If you look at that serous edema around the lids, about those watery looking eyes, you know, at first presentation, you might think that's allergic conjunctivitis. So treated with oral steroids for eight weeks, de developed double vision, and finally diagnosed with thyroid eye disease. Treated with methoprednisone for six weeks and then um, developed loss of color vision. And so we can see uh, the vision in this patient's eyes not doing so great, 2080 in the right, 2060 in the left. IOP markedly increased. Is that a steroid response? Possibly. Um, is that um, increase from compression of the globe? Maybe. Uh, minus two in upgaze in the right eye. Uh, APD in the right eye as well. So when we see APDs, we really think neuro, right? Um, so very important to check closely in pupils in these patients, uh, to check color vision in these patients, which was deficient in the right eye. Um, and of course, visual field. OCT might be giving us some insights as well, but usually um, might take a little later for that to uh, become dysfunctional. So we have to check all the, all the boxes here when we're assessing optic nerve function. And you can see this patient's optic nerve is decreased um, because of their decreased visual field, color vision, APD. So compression going on. And this is unfortunate to see, you know, optic nerve compression is an ocular emergency. Um, this is oculoplastics uh, surgeons. They don't like to do emergent surgery on hot inflamed eyes, um, but they're going to need to get in there and make space for that optic nerve so it doesn't atrophy and die completely. Um, so they'll go in and knock out a couple bones, orbital decompression, going in there, getting the patient in the operating room as soon as possible, decompressing by removal of bone to make more space for the ocular, uh, the orbital contents and removing some pressure off the op that optic nerve. But it's not a fun thing to do for the patient or for the surgeon, because we know how much inflammation, everything that's going on there. Um, so IV steroids to avoid inflammation as well and orbital decompression urgently or, or really emergently. If you ever see a patient with this, uh, you need to speak with a surgeon uh, immediately. So um, next steps. So we decompressed and saved the optic nerve. Um, we've got the strabismus that's causing constant diplopia. So eventually these patients require strabismus surgery. And once that calms down, eventually uh, eyelid surgery with their oculoplastics colleagues. So I'm, I'm blessed to be uh, pretty near the University of Minnesota and they actually have a thyroid team. So we'll send patients to the thyroid eye disease team and they'll see neuro-ophthalmologist um, a strabismus specialist, as well as uh, neuro-ophthalmology, and they'll all go in, all three ophthalmologists will go in and see patients together, which is kind of a special uh, setting and special clinic, but so important for these patients. Again, this is that patient's journey. So starting in uh, March 2015, when they were diagnosed with uh, allergic conjunctivitis, we can see 2015 to 2016, 2017, this patient's finally back to normal. Um, post-strabismus surgery, decompressive surgery, and then eyelid surgery. Um, so three surgeries to get this patient back to normal, but um, things are never the same. As you can imagine, these are not um, precise surgeries when we're knocking out bone. Um, just to hit on those extraocular muscles one more time, the old adage uh, is I'm slow when regards, with regards to what muscles get attacked most often. So inferior rectus seems to be the, the favorite of thyroid eye disease, then followed by the medial, superior, lateral, and then obliques. Again, this is a fibrotic restriction. This is not a paralysis. This is a fibrotic restriction. So the patient can't look up typically 
has increased eye pressure when they look up. Um, that's where there's going to be more problems because that inferior rectus is scarred down. Um, so thyroid eye disease is the most common extra thyroid manifestation of Graves' disease, its own separate entity. Um, we can see Graves' disease in the pink or purple here and thyroid eye disease in the yellow, but there's this overlap, right? They're separate things, but they overlap. Up to 50% of patients with Graves' disease will develop thyroid eye disease. So half of your patients with Graves' disease are going to have thyroid eye disease sometime in their life. Again, Graves' disease, the goal there is to keep their thyroid levels at an appropriate level. Um, thyroid eye disease uh, attack of the orbital contents, not necessarily related to high serum thyroid concentrations. So uh, their thyroid levels might be euthyroid, where they should be, might be low, might be high, doesn't matter, they still get thyroid eye disease. Uh, and treating that thyroid gland with iodine or anything doesn't help their thyroid eye disease. Again, it might even increase after, the, uh, after their thyroid is treated with radioactive iodine. 10% of your thyroid eye disease patients will be hypo, low, or euthyroid. So not everyone's hyperthyroid. And it might be before, during, or after the onset of their Graves' disease. So thyroid eye disease has been a long time disease of watching and waiting. We kind of see it happening. We go through this long course of letting it calm down. The traditional treatments of steroids and radiation and things have significant side effects and not that much benefit. And surgical interventions kind of have been reserved until things are calm and, and or sight-threatening disease with, you know, corneal ulceration, perforation, and or optic nerve compression. And there's this thing called Rundle's curve that you might have remembered or studied when you think about thyroid eye disease. Uh, it was kind of described as the, as the course of thyroid eye disease by Dr. Rundle a long, long time ago, where there's this active phase, this progressive active phase that kind of burns itself out or calms down eventually and re then enters this fibrotic stage where the inflammation has calmed down, but the leftovers are in, uh, scarring. Uh, from that inflammation leaves the patient at this kind of now the new normal, so to speak, the fibrotic phase. So um, that initial inflammatory progressive phase usually lasts about a year in non-smokers and two to three years in smokers. And that's Rundle's curve. But if we think about when we would want to treat these patients, if we could catch this early and stop this disease process, we would probably want to catch them in that early progressive phase to cut off that curve, to lower that curve. As we can see here, demonstrated uh, here, if we can cut that red part off quicker and stop that inflammatory process, we can lead to a lower fibrotic stage, less manifestations that are chronic. All right. So Self-limiting, we talked about this kind of like, yeah, it's going to burn itself out. We'll just watch and wait. We'll watch and wait. Um, our patients really don't see it that way. And we need to remember to, I like to say, see it from the other side of the slit lamp sometimes, and especially with these patients, the quality of life, how this uh, affects the patients cosmetically, um, affects their quality of life. They can't drive if they're seeing double. Um, all these things can be a horribly deep debilitating disease um, for our patients. Um, and, and really, they're not seeing it as a self-limiting disease, that only 2% of patients consider themselves recovered even after all these kind of calm down end of Rundle's curve. So remember um, to see it from your patient sign, be empathetic, listen to their complaints, um, and, and do the best you can for them. That's our jobs. Um, so labs. So those that said I'd order some labs, um, is this what you'd order? Um, labs for thyroid, TSH, T3, T4? I would argue no, that is not what you order. Um, you should be ordering a thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins uh, levels. Um, there's also a TRAB, uh, say you can, that's thyroid receptor antibody uh, score. So we're, as eye care providers, worried about thyroid eye disease. Um, if you're worried about the patient's thyroid levels, if you're worried about their, if they're hyperthyroid or hypothyroid, or if they don't have a diagnosis of Graves' disease, 
eh, then I can see the saying that TSH, T3, T4 would be important. But really, as eye care providers, if we're trying to detect thyroid eye disease, if this patient has diplopia that's unexplained, they have lid retraction, they have atypical allergic conjunctivitis, T3, T4 don't matter at all. You shouldn't be ordering those. You should be ordering TSI. If you want to order them both, great, but you should be ordering thyroid-stimulating immunobodies. You're looking for the antibodies that are attacking the orbits and attacking um, those extraocular contacts. So the Travisase contain both TSI and uh, TRAB antibodies and uh, have little relevance. TSI, TSH, T3, T4 are a measure of thyroid activity, not thyroid eye disease. They have little relevance with regard to thyroid eye disease. All right. I think I've driven that point home, hopefully. So how do we treat thyroid eye disease? So, you know, we try and get the patient through it, calm it down, steroids, and then surgery, and then more surgery and more surgery, and then they uh, protect the cornea, protect the optic nerve until we can get them calmed down. Well, that used to be the watch and wait that we talked about, um, but it was emotionally and psychologically and uh, debilitating disease. So there's a new normal. Uh, for treating thyroid eye disease. Hopefully you've heard of this, um, but there was some research in this pathway. The insulin growth factor 1R receptor um, was found to be part of, um, part of thyroid eye disease. This pathway of stimulating the insulin growth factor 1R um, is what actually activates those uh, fibroblasts in our orbits. And by blocking that IGF-1R, the inflammation and uh, activation of the fibroblasts has been halted. And so that research led to um, the development of some treatments for thyroid eye disease. Again, here is kind of a picture of this inflammation that's happening. We've got those orbital uh, fibroblasts, activation of IGF-1R uh, with thyroid stimulating receptor antibodies, and then cytokine re release, uh, orbital fats expansion, uh, muscle uh, fibrosis, all those things we talked about in the in the orbital disease. Again, uh, attacking those, causing expansion of um, those by attacking, uh, activating fibroblasts in in the eye and in the orbit. So FDA approval of teprotumumab occurred in January 2020, which is specifically designed to block that IGF-1R and halt that signaling pathway in the orbit. So a phase three trial uh, found teprotumumab could significantly reduce both proptosis and diplopia in patients with active moderate to severe thyroid eye disease. At week 24, 83% of patients experienced a reduction in proptosis as opposed to 10% of placebos. The secondary outcomes also had significantly improved uh, uh, quality of life and uh, findings with clinical activity score and diplopia as well. So all those things we talked about were improved post-treatment with this uh, medication called teprotumumab, uh, which was FDA approved again in January 2020 for active thyroid eye disease. This was the inclusion criteria for uh, their trials, their uh, phase two and phase three trials. Uh, this is the uh, article that kind of released this information in this journal. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so TEPRO for the treatment there. Again, um, this is the uh, improvements that we're seeing, TEPRO versus placebo, and you can see their uh, p-values there. Delve into this further if you'd like to do more. I have some more resources at the end. But this is kind of the hit-home picture for me. This is, this is really before and after uh, TEPRO treatment, and you can just say, yep, wow. Again, primary endpoint was reduction of proptosis by two millimeters or more. Uh, in TEPRO versus placebo, you can, you can see how much improvement there was in that proptosis as a primary endpoint, um, as well as uh, clinical activity score, uh, proptosis again, um, and patients that had a clinical activity score of zero or one, so no clinical activity score after treatment. Um, there's also some more classifications things. I know we talked about CAS score. I just wanted to throw that out there again as we were talking about it. But the no specs classification, you might see that talked about in thyroid eye disease circles as well. 
uh, no physical signs, only signs, soft tissue involvement, proptosis, EOM signs, corneal environment, and sight loss, so no specs. Um, how is this given to our patients, or how was it given to patients in the studies? Well, it's an infusion. Um, so these patients have an infusion, um, eight infusions total, um, three weeks in between for 24 weeks total. So these patients at the end of the study were really at that 24-week mark. Most common adverse events. So what else do we need to know as eye care providers about teprotumumab? Um, there can be uh, adverse reactions, you know, infusion reactions can occur anytime we're infusing anything, um, but also um, other things. Uh, hyperglycemia is a big one if we have diabetics or fragile diabetics. Um, it may worsen inflammatory bowel disease, so that has to be uh, noted and addressed. Um, and then some weird hearing things that happened in these uh, infusions and, and these patients. So loss of hearing, kind of hearing yourself underwater, these sort of things also happened, uh, and, but most of these resolved, um, but that uh, there's been further research into this that's coming, um, but things we need to educate our patients about, we might want to do a hearing screening um, before, uh, before starting therapy so we have a baseline so we know if something was affected, um, as, as well as A1C and uh, talking to anyone that has inflammatory bowel possibilities. And then again, um, mostly women here. So pregnancy is to be avoided uh, for six months after the final infusion because of the long half-life of this drug. But really, I, what I want you to take home from this is the watch and wait thing is not an option anymore. These patients do not have to sit around for three or four years before they get back to normal. We have the opportunity to interrupt Rundle's curve much earlier. If we can detect the disease earlier, treat it earlier, of course we're gonna get better outcomes. Would you wanna treat a glaucoma patient with a 0.2 cup or a 0.9 cup? And waiting until it's a 0.9 cup is not acceptable anymore. That's my point to you. So we're gonna talk more about symptoms here. Uh, what symptoms make you suspicious of thyroid eye disease? All right, so to see this from the other side, we know that the inflammation from the orbit can cause um, ocular surface disease issues, but maybe it's not just thyroid, uh, uh, sorry, maybe it's not just ocular surface disease. Maybe this is actually thyroid eye disease and not just ocular surface disease. Um, I asked an um, oculoplastic specialist, like when you're seeing patients and you're like, oh my gosh, this is thyroid eye disease. Why didn't somebody diagnose this sooner? I would said, what? are you seeing that we should have picked up on as ocular surface disease specialists to maybe cue us in and have our spidey sense go off about thyroid eye disease? And this is what she told me. So orbital congestion. So not uh, to be mistaken for uh, conjunctivitis, but congestion, really congested conjunctiva and allergic conjunctivitis um, with, without papillary reaction. So you're not seeing papillae, but you're diagnosing allergic conjunctivitis and you're treating it and it's not getting better. So any allergic conjunctivitis that's treated with, you know, N, um, antihistamines and steroids and isn't getting better, our spidey sense should go off. Unexplained changes in vision. So you're seeing a dry a patient and their vision's getting worse, 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 but that shouldn't be because their cornea is looking better and better. So anytime we're looking at those things, we need to uh, look at the optic nerve and just don't stop at the cornea. Uh, temporal chemosis along the extraocular mus uh, muscles. So we're seeing injection overlying the extraocular muscles and that chronic ocular ache and pain, as opposed to the more shooting pains that dry eye patients complain about, this kind of deep, thick, um, constant ocular pain. So again, some symptom things at uh, thyroid eye disease um, diagnosis, dryness and grittiness in 60 per, almost 60% of the patients, uh, really common thing. So pain behind the eyes, headache, um, and blurry vision, itchy eyes. During that chronic phase, though, again, dryness, grittiness, and itchiness being a huge problem for or a huge symptom report uh, for our patients. So itchiness, something to think about uh, when we're assessing our patients with dry eye and ocular allergies and, and other things. A huge effect on our quality of life and our patients. I think I um, brought that home, but uh, quality of life is, is greatly affected. But at the same time, you know, we're looking for dry eye and making sure it's not thyroid eye disease. 
We also need to realize that our thyroid eye disease patients will have dry eyes, that the disease, this inflammatory autoimmune disease is going to cause dry eyes. So whether you want it to be or not, thyroid eye disease is part of optometry. If we're treating diplopia, if we're treating dry eye, which I hope we all are, um, then this is part of our wheelhouse. This is part of us. And we need to be part of this disease and part of this process to better care for these patients. So it's going to decrease their tear production. And actually, we saw lacquer uh, gland volume and tear production increase after treatment of these patients with thyroid eye disease treatment with teprotumumab. Um, it's not just an eye problem. It also uh, affects our uh, muscles and our face and the fat accumulation and our in our cheeks and everything else too. So just kind of an interesting thing that this is really a systemic process that's going on. Um, and then chronic thyroid eye disease. What about the patients that have had uh, thyroid eye disease for 10 years? Um, they're not in the active phase. What about them? Well, there's been a bunch of case studies that are really pointing towards teprotumumab having a, a great effect or a role in a chronic thyroid eye disease, not just active uh, thyroid eye disease. So there's been some uh, research on this um, and cases published, but they showed that uh, patients with chronic uh, thyroid eye disease showed marked improvement with proptosis, clinical activity score, and diplopia as well. Um, again, this is a patient um, that had a nine-year history of thyroid eye disease, treated with everything under the sun, and after eight fusions had a clinical activity score zero, uh, his uh, proptosis was reduced, and um, a gross improvement in his appearance as well. Um, so when patients come to you and ask about future developments, um, where do you go? Well, I would suggest you check out uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so if you're thinking about patients with thyroid eye disease and chronic versus active and what's being done, um, if you go to clinicalstudies.gov, type in thyroid eye disease, hit search, um, you can see that there's a whole lot of research going on with thyroid eye disease you can direct your patients to this because they're actually actively enrolling for a study of teprotumumab in patients with chronic inactive thyroid eye disease at the bottom here. Um, so several places that are recruiting and uh, opportunity for your patients to maybe be involved in some research with thyroid eye disease right now. Um, but it's also great for other things if you're looking for what's going on with um, retinitis pigmentosa or whatever. Um, so just to kind of make sure that things are sticking where I'm putting them. Uh, teprotumumab is effective in treating what types of thyroid eye disease? Active early, long-standing chronic, or all of the above? Hopefully, uh, hopefully I hit home that, that there's some opportunities here. Again, this is a long journey for our patients. Um, and there's a team involved, primary care, ophthalmology, endocrinology, optometry, of course. Um, binocular vision, ocular surface disease, neuroplastics, everyone. So be part of that journey. Uh, be involved with your patients with thyroid eye disease. They need your help. They need help with their diplopia. They need help monitoring their proptosis. They need help treating their ocular surface disease. They need help somebody monitoring their optic nerve frequently. So be part of the story. Build your network. Build your team. Be part of the village. And just final question here would, and that'll start off our um, question and answer portion of this. Would you feel comfortable writing in a prescription for teprotumumab for an infusion for thyroid eye disease? Awesome. Thank you for listening, participating. I hope this you found this interesting. I hope you can take this to your patients and help them see better in the future. Dr. Lang, thank you for your very, very informative overview of thyroid eye disease. Um, and what I really appreciate is how engaging you were during your actual presentation as well, because I think you provided such great pearls during your presentation. And it was so helpful that you could also answer questions during the conversation and your presentation. The audience loves being able to interact because there's a lot of activity and I was shocked. I thought you've been out in practice maybe five years because you've got such a baby face. You've been <laughs> out for almost two decades now. And We're so you've close. definitely seen the shift in the management of thyroid eye disease. Thyroid right. eye disease 
with tepratumumab to pay. You got it. Yeah. Coming out two and a half years ago has really changed how first line therapy talk about disruptive innovation right there. Right. So can you walk us through, do you really think that one from the payer perspective, I really think that it really has truly changed the way medicine is being performed and practiced in thyroid eye disease. Um, but is that real? I mean, is do you see the true benefits of it? Because two millimeters doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a lot. Am I wrong? Yeah. No, it's a lot, right? I mean, this is such a debilitating uh, disease for our patients that, I mean, any any benefit we can give these patients, the cosmetic, the lifestyle changes, problems this delivers to our patients is really under-recognized and under undervalued. Their quality of life changes so much um, as they're going through this disease and, and having it be a chronic disease, something that we can't cure. Um, it's really underrated the psychological and, and lifestyle changes that happen to these patients. So this shift from watch and wait to actually doing something and getting as much improvement. And again, those those um, those numbers are really mean numbers, average numbers. So some people are you know super responders and some people not as much, but um, there's a lot more data now coming out with the last couple of years, Tepro being out with chronic disease, uh, patients that have had this for decades and seeing improvement. So I, it really has been disruptive. I think that was a key word there, Liz. And with the actual um, ophthalmology, the MD community, particularly with oculoplastics, it seems to be there, it has resonated. It seems that the acceptance is very real. Now, maybe some are bigger believers than others. What have you experienced within, you know, the, especially with your connection with the with academia yeah. and the University of Minnesota? Do academicians buy it? My experience has been that, yeah, they, they're bought in, that um, they want to remove the inflammation. Um, especially before surgery. I mean, we're not going to get rid of these surgeries. Um, you know, there's going to be this emergent, you know, decompression surgeries that are going to happen. We're going to want to do eyelid procedures on these patients once they're stable. But, you know, as, as a surgeon yourself, you know, I, I would propose the question, you know, do you do you calm down a uveitis before you perform cataract surgery? Do you treat ocular surface disease before you're doing this stuff? And and that leads to, to, I'm sure, better outcomes. So um, our, our plastics, neuro, um, strabismus uh, colleagues have bought in too because they want better surgical outcomes as well. I think that is such a beautiful analogy and it's so much safer. Granted, yes, we have to worry about the ototoxicity. So that neurologic component, which is rare in terms of the irreversible type of changes, very, very small and albeit rare, but beyond that, which we can catch on a more quicker basis and then make certain to stop. Um, and I wanna query you right there, um, but to be able to quiesce that inflammation, um, how does that you know, compare to steroids? And it seems to be preferable and ototoxicity, how common is it? It's really, really very rare. Um... There was a, you know, the case, I can't remember the ends and the percentage wise, but um, uh, from the trials, but more and more of that's coming out now. They're doing further research to really understand how rare it is, but it, it's really rather rare and seems to be uh, mostly self-limiting during the treatment time and things tend to get a little better afterwards. But um, um, audiology screening before patients go on is, is going to be critical um, so we can all learn how common this is and how uh, how much more uh, effect is there afterwards. Agree. Yeah, I, it seems like there's no free lunch. And mm. you're right, depending on the severity of thyroid eye disease and that patient's level, it totally makes sense. And then obviously, these are patients that you guys are managing back and forth where you are taking care of their primary disease state beyond the acute, acute disease especially for those with the severe diseases where they require the decompression, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I think the take home there was, you know, it really takes a village for these patients. And, you know, as an optometrist, a lot of my role is managing their ocular surface disease and helping them through that process, being a resource for them, being a, 
intermediary between some of the other subspecialties? I think the education that you provide them and the chair time, that's so important. And that back and forth and that patient-centered care, whether it's from you, the MD, the plastic surgeon, all of that is so key for this, you know, that lifetime chronic disease, because it's not only when they are hyperthyroid, it's when they're hypo or euthyroid. Exactly. So thank you for all those take-home pearls on this great thyroid eye disease talk, Dr. Lang. Um, we really appreciated you and your interactivity. Um, the raffle code for this section was SMILE, S-M-I-L-E. Um, Dr. Lang, have a wonderful afternoon from all of us. We really appreciate it from here through ta um, Tasmania, Tasmania to, yeah, West um, Africa, Ghana, people wow. everywhere are turning, are uh, tuning in to listen to this. So greatly appreciated. Thank you. Honor, honor and a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Liz. Always, always a pleasure to work with you.